you have your Bible, open up to the book of Jeremiah, book of Jeremiah, let's all stand please, Jeremiah chapter 18, the book of Jeremiah chapter 18. Starting in verse number one, Jeremiah chapter 18, starting in verse number one. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord. Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Lord, we pray you might bless this word right now. Lord, have your way. Speak as only you can right now. Touch, heal, deliver, set free. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. While I was incapacitated, while I was in the hospital, the Lord had a chance speak and I took the opportunity to listen to what the Lord had to say and he impressed upon me the fact that I am we are clay that we don't have the right the power or the wisdom to dictate to God what we want. We don't have the right or the privilege to tell God what we want to be or what we want to do. As we just read, as clay is in the potter's hand, so are we in his hand. The potter is the individual who creates pottery, cups, and glasses, and bowls, and all sorts of things. And it says here that the potter, that the vessel that he was making was marred in the potter's hand. Marred, that means it was, it was ruined, it was, it was corrupted, it was, it was out of shape in the potter's hand. And that's a picture of you and that's a picture of me. We are not as we should be. We are not in a place where we need to be. We are corrupted. We are, another word for this word, marred is, is, is ruined. We are ruined, we are marred. We have problems. You have issues. If you deny the fact that you have issues, then you are here today and you are lying. You have issues. I have issues. And the only one that can deal with our issues is God. It's God. He's the only one. You can't do it yourself. We were just singing a song. We were just singing a song. Lord, I want to be a Christian. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart. Do you really want, do you really want to be like Jesus? You have to ask yourself that question. Do I really want to be like Jesus? Or do I do this on Sunday morning for form or fashion? Do I do it because of tradition? Why do I do? Why do I come? Why am I here? Do you see, let me go even deeper, do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a Christian, if you're here? 
And I know there are some here today who are Christians, and I know there are many here who are not. But let me speak to you today if you are a Christian. Do you see growth in your life? Growth. Do you see yourself spiritually in the same place you were last year at this time? Or has there been movement? As we spoke at the beginning of the year, my mantra for this year is to go forth. Go forward. As God told the children of Israel, go forward. Do you see yourself spiritually in the same place you were? Have you made changes to your life? Have you done something in your life that is going to cause you to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? What are you doing? If you say you want to follow Jesus, if you say you want to be like Jesus, what are you doing to be like Jesus? How are you feeding yourself? What are you doing externally that will affect you internally? What are you doing? He says that what he wants to do here, he wants, he wants to mold us. See, it's not up to you to decide what you want to be. It's not up to you to decide what you want to do. You know, I had years ago, years ago, when I was in another church years ago, there were two ladies. There were two ladies who were, who were walking, and I was in the teaching ministry, and we had a little table set up with brochures for those who maybe wanted to be a teacher. And there were these two ladies that I still remember that were walking around because different ministries had their tables up. And they were walking around literally as if they were shopping for a ministry. Shopping. They were, they were trying to choose what they wanted to do. Now, it doesn't sound bad the way I'm saying it, but if you would have been there, if you would have saw them, they were together. And they were asking one another, do you want to be in this ministry? No, I don't like this ministry, no. They went to the next, you want to be a part of that? No, they got up to my, they got up to the table where I was. You want to be a teacher? No, I don't want to be a teacher. And, and, and that picture has stayed with me all these years. You don't decide what you want to do when it comes to ministry. You don't decide. I did not decide to be a teacher. I did not say, you know what? Lord, I want to be a teacher. I did not decide. I did not decide to be a preacher. I didn't wake up one morning and say, you know what? I, I, I think I, I like preaching. I want to be a preacher. That's not how it happens. God does place. He places something within you that you know that the Lord is pulling you in a certain direction. And I knew that the Lord wanted me to be a teacher, not because I said it myself, I want to be a teacher because he placed it upon my heart. You are a teacher. You are a teacher. And that's not what I wanted to do. That's not what I wanted to be. Do you think I, if you knew me, if you really, really knew me, really knew me, you would know that standing up in front of a group of people is not what I want to do. It's not what I like to do. But the Lord said, teach. I will be with your mouth. I will give you what to say. And he has not failed me yet. So I know that when I stand up in front of people to preach or teach, I know it's not me. It's not me. But you don't get to decide what you want to be. He says, as clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hands. Do you see yourself, do you see yourself as a lump of clay? Because that's what you are. In his hand, that he is the potter. He is molding you. He is shaping you. You are a lump of clay. And it says here, notice what it says. It says that he saw that it was marred, it was ruined, it was corrupt. It says that he made it again or he made it over again into another vessel as it seemed good 
for him to make. He didn't ask. He didn't ask the lump of clay, what do you want? He didn't ask the lump of clay, where you want to be? He didn't ask the lump of clay, what you want to do? He made that marred piece of clay into something different. He made it new again. Whatever, however it pleased him. That's how we need to surrender ourselves to the Lord. Surrender. So if you say that you really want to follow Jesus, if you really want to follow him, there are certain things that you need to do. Go with me real quick to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Chapter number 2. Second Timothy chapter two. And I'll start in verse number 20. It says, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Let me just explain what he's talking about there. When he's talking about honor and dishonor, when he's talking about wood and clay and gold and silver, all he means is there are people who have different ministries. Different ministries. One ministry is not better than another. Now one ministry may be more in the forefront. Being a teacher, you're out in the forefront. Being a teacher or a preacher, all eyes are on you. But you may be the one who picks up paper off the floor. You may be the one that sweeps or mops. That may be what the Lord has called you to do. So people don't put a lot of emphasis on a ministry like that but trust me it is a ministry and any ministry from God is good whatever the Lord calls you to be to do you are blessed you are blessed so that's what he means by vessels of gold and silver and wood and clay some for honor some for dishonor when he says dishonor he doesn't mean it in the sense that it's a bad thing he just means it's a different level it's a different degree it's a different type of ministry Verse number 21, therefore, if anyone cleanse himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. There are certain things, there are certain things in your life, in my life, that we need to get rid of. We need to allow the potter to work in us. We need to allow the potter to shape us into what he wants us to be. There is no such thing as a piece of clay rising up and taking over and telling the potter what they want to do with me. That is not possible. We want to make sure that we are vessels of honor, sanctified, that means set apart and useful for the master. Do you want to be used by God? If you want to be used by God, there's going to have to be a certain amount of submission on your part, allowing God to work in your life. You have to allow God to work in your life. Verse number 22, here's what we need to do. If you really want to follow him, he says, flee also youthful lust. Flee, run from youthful lust. Those things that young people are drawn to. Young people are drawn to money. Young people are drawn to power. A young people are drawn to a popularity. Young people are drawn to many different things. But these many different things are not always good for the soul. They're not good for the soul. He says to flee from these things. Run away. There are three ways. There are three ways that young people and any person, young or old, will be tempted in this life. You have the lust of the flesh, you have the lust of the eyes, and you have the pride of life. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of flesh is just those appetites, those appetites of the body that you want, that you want to do something to please your flesh. You want to do something to please your flesh. It runs from food to 
to sex, to money, it, 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 your flesh drives you to do certain things that are not right. Then you have the lust of the eyes. Whatever you see is what you want. Whatever you look at is what you desire. Maybe it's something that someone else has. Maybe it's something that you can't afford. But what you see is what you want. The lust of the eyes. And then you have the pride of life. The pride of life. Anything that's going to vaunt you. Anything that's going to lift you up. Anything that's going to make you look better in someone else's eyes. And make you feel better in your own eyes. The, the pride of life. And all of us, if you've ever been tempted, and I know you have. You will be tempted in any one of those three categories. That's how it works. And so you have to learn how. You have to learn how to deal with those particular temptations. Here's what he says. Flee youthful lusts. Run away. Run away from sinful activities. Run away from sinful companions. I don't care if your companions are church folks. You've heard me say a million times, some of the worst things that I've done, I was with church folks when I did it. You don't want to allow church folks to mess up your life because church folks will mess up your life. You hang out with the wrong person, you go ahead. You hang out with, 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 with brother so-and-so's daughter Sister so-and-so's son, because you think that everything is all good and everything is all Christian-y. Be careful. Be careful. You want to watch yourself. Bad communications corrupt good morals or good manners. Bad communication. You have to watch who you are with. Don't tell me that, oh, they go to church. That means nothing. That means nothing to tell me that. If I'm your parent, you tell, well, they go to church. That, what does that mean? What does that mean? The devil goes to church. The devil goes to church. Trust me. And so when you say that person goes to church, that, that, has, that has no meaning. That has no meaning at all. He says, flee youthful lust. Run away. But... Here's what you need to follow. Run away from the bad. But you need to go after. You need to pursue. You need to follow after. He says, righteousness. You really want to follow Jesus? Do you really want to be like Jesus? He says, pursue. Go after. Follow. He says, righteousness. Righteousness. He says, pursue. Faith. Pursue it. Go after it. Faith. He says, follow after love and also peace. And here's where your fellowship comes in. Here's where your fellowship comes in. He says, follow these things with, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. See, there are certain individuals that you need to be with. There are certain individuals in order to follow through, in order to follow through and, 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 and be like Jesus, you have to do it with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Why? Because you cannot live this life by yourself. You cannot live the Christian life by yourself. You are not in a vacuum. You cannot do it alone. You need the help of others. And he says, do it with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You need to stay away from hypocritical people. Stay away from phony people. Stay away from people who talk a big game, but they don't have the life. Stay away from those people. They will lead you down a wrong road. Trust me, I can tell you some stories that I haven't told you yet. Be with people who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Those individuals that have the same spiritual goals as you do. 
those who also want to be like Jesus. The Bible says that iron sharpens iron. The Bible says that two are better than one. The Bible says that there is a brother born out of adversity. Sometimes the folk in your family are not the people that you need to be with. I know you live in your house, so you can't leave your house. So we're not saying, we're not advocating that you leave your house. But sometimes family, if you're a child of God, you're a Christian, sometimes family don't know where you're coming from. They don't know where you're coming from. If you love the Lord and, you, and your parents or your brother or your sister, they don't know anything about what you, who you are in Christ. That can be problematic. That can be problematic. So you want to make sure that you have other people, Christian folk, who understand where you're coming from. See, sometimes you need, sometimes you need somebody to talk to. Sometimes you need somebody to talk to. I know, I know, the first person that you got to call on, call on the Lord, call on Jesus. Yes, 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 yes. Call on Jesus. He should be number one. Bring your burdens to the Lord. Cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. That's exactly what, he, what you're supposed to do. But sometimes, many times, you need a physical ear. You need that person. You need the flesh. You need somebody to hear you out. And you have to make sure you have at least that one person in your life that you can talk to, that you can trust. Can't trust everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Can't trust everybody. Because everybody is not on your side. I don't care what they say. I don't care if they say hi. I don't care if they hug you. I don't care if they kiss you on your cheek, on your head. Everybody is not for you. You must make sure that you have somebody that you trust. That you trust. He says, follow after these things with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Out of a pure heart. Here's what needs to happen. If you really want to follow Jesus, stop flirting with Jesus. Stop flirting with Jesus. Uh, if I were to well, we go ahead, go right ahead. Have you ever, y'all are old enough, you, you ever flirt with somebody? You ever, you ever flirt with somebody? You know, you, you flirted with somebody. Girls, you know how it is when you flirt with somebody. Guys, you know how it is when you flirt with somebody. You, you know. And I don't know, I don't really know what your intentions are when you're flirting, but, but you flirt. You, you, you're letting them know that you're interested in some kind of way. You don't know how far it's gonna go, but you let them know that I'm here. I'm here. But we need to stop flirting with Jesus. Showing up, praying, talking a good game, but not living the life. We need to stop flirting with Jesus. We need to stop teasing Jesus. You say, Brother Michael, how can I, how, how can I, how can I tease Jesus? You tease Jesus by not being real. But not being real. You don't give them your all, you give them a part. You just give them a piece of yourself. You're not willing to submit your whole self. You still hold back, you still keep back large parts of yourself. Remember, remember, <laughs> the Lord does not want weekend visits. He wants full custody, full custody. And when we just give him the weekend visit, when we just give him two or three hours on Sunday, and the rest of the week belongs to us, you're teasing Jesus. You're teasing him. You're, you're, you're flirting with Jesus. That's not how you want to live your Christian life. You don't want to flirt. You don't want to flirt with Jesus. You need to pursue. In the book of Luke, let me go to the book of Luke. Let me try to close right now. Luke. Luke chapter number nine. Luke chapter nine. Luke nine, verse number 23. Luke chapter nine and verse number 23. 
Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him, listen very carefully, these three things you must do if you say you want to follow Jesus. If you want to come after him, that's what he means. Come after, follow. He says, let that person, number one, deny himself. Deny himself. That's the first thing. But what does that mean to deny yourself? The popular opinion says that to deny yourself means, okay, that means I cannot go to the, I can't, I can't go to the movies. I like the movies, so I'm not going to go. Or I like to do this, so I'm not going to do this anymore. Not, that's not what he means by deny yourself. That's not, what's, that's not what's going on when he says deny yourself. What he means when he says deny yourself, he means come to the point in your life where you believe, where you know that you can't do it on your own. Push away from yourself any notion that you can change yourself. You cannot change yourself. You cannot sanctify yourself. You cannot do it. You must push away. The, listen, listen, the Bible, the Bible says, the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare, and as soon as you walk into this Christian life, you're in a war. The weapons of our warfare, the Bible says, are not carnal. That means there's nothing that you can do to affect spiritual change in your life. You cannot fight this warfare with weapons of human imagination. I'm not taking questions. You cannot, you cannot fight this Christian life with weapons of your own making. You cannot do it. And I, it, it, bears, it bears mentioning again how I watched this video that was uploaded on social media and how they were there. This church, probably right here in Brooklyn, probably right here because I, I knew a lot of people that were in there. And they had knives and axes and swords and machetes. They had all these things waving them because they were they had a special service to break curses. To break curses. You tell me how are you going to break any curse with a sword, a knife, a machete, an axe, a blade of any kind. How is that going to break any curse? How is that going to loose anybody from any kind of bondage that they are in spiritually? It is, it is the height, it is the height of stupidity, it is the height of foolishness, it is the height of bad teaching. To even tell people, we are going to fight the devil with these swords and knives. That's why the church is in this place. I'm not talking about the church in general. That's why the church is in the state that it's in. Because you have people running around telling people to do stupid things that are not going to do anything to change their life spiritually. Every single person in that church, I guarantee you, they went home still in bondage. And if anybody was in the building that was had a curse on them, they went home with the curse still on them. Because none of that is going to do anything. You see, you need to make sure, you need to make sure that you don't listen to those, uh, to those types of things because every, every time I bring, every time I mention, every time I bring it up, it does something to me. Anyway, <clears throat> so he says, deny yourself. Remove from yourself any notion that you can bring change to your own life. He says, secondly, you want to follow me? He says, take up your cross. 
take up your cross. Once again, the popular opinion, people say, oh, take up your cross. That means that I have to just, I have to just deal with my hard times. I'm just bearing my cross. I'm just bearing my, I'm just living this life. I'm having a hard time. I'm bearing my cross. That's not what it's talking about. That's not what it means to take up your cross, to take up your hard load, to take up your hard times and carry them with you. That's not what it means. To take up your cross means to come to the conclusion that you have an understanding that every single blessing that you have came because Jesus died on the cross. Every single blessing comes from the cross. Every single blessing. Take up, take up the knowledge of what Jesus did on the cross. Take that with you. And he says, take up the cross how many times? He says, daily. Every single day, you need to acquaint yourself with the cross. Every single day. No, you don't get saved all over again. You get saved one time. But what happened at the cross, you need to keep it fresh in your spirit daily. Take up your cross daily. Every day. You're going to need the cross today. You are going to need the cross today. Why? Because you're going to sin today. You're going to sin today. You've already sinned today, many of you. Many of us. You've already sinned. You need the cross daily. You need to remember that at the cross, I find forgiveness. At the cross. Taking up your cross daily is talking about sanctification. Daily. Sanctification. You ever heard somebody say, I'm saved and I'm sanctified? Well, it's not a lie. If they're really saved, they are sanctified. They got sanctified the moment they got saved. But now, are you living sanctified? Is that your way of life? Are you living in a sanctified state. Once again, that's talking about following Jesus. You decide. You decide whether you are going to sin or not. Some of you here today will decide to sin. Some of those sins that you commit today, yeah, I'm getting personal. Some of those sins that you will commit today will be intentional done on purpose, done with the full knowledge that what you just did was wrong. You will sin that way. You may sin that way today. What do you do when you sin openly, vividly, knowingly? What do you do? How do you overcome that type of sin? You gotta bring it to Jesus. He doesn't kick you out. He's not gonna push you away. He's not gonna say, oh, here you go again. No, 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 no. You have to, you, you have to, you have to throw yourself on the mercy of God. Boldly, the Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace to receive mercy in the time of need. When you sin, you need mercy and you find it at the cross. You need to keep that fresh in your spirit that I can always go to the cross, always go to the cross, always go to the cross. That's why I need to take up my cross daily. And he says, finally, follow me. Psalm chapter 63, verse number eight says, my soul follows hard. After you. You know what it means to follow hard? You know what it means to follow hard? Robert, put yourself right in front of me. To follow hard. Start walking. Slowly, slowly. Not walking over there. Just start walking. Go ahead. Go, 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 go. Move, 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 move. You see, I'm not letting him go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You see, where he walked. I was right beside him. He turned, I'm right with him. 
follow hard, it means to follow close. Close. You really want to be like Jesus? You got to follow close. Don't let him go. Don't let him move out of your sight. Just, just keep him right where he goes, you go. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Follow hard after Jesus. Follow hard. When I was, when I was, <coughs> when I was laying on my back, the Lord impressed upon me certain things. The fact that we are vessels, yes. But we need to allow the Lord to mold us, number one, into vessels of prayer. We need to allow the Lord to mold us into vessels of prayer. What kind of prayer? We, we, we all pray. Many of you have prayed already today. Many of you are going to pray later on today. You're going to pray. Uh, you're going to pray over your food. You're going to pray when you get in your car. You're gonna pray when you, you you're gonna you're gonna pray today. But well, what kind of prayer am I talking about? I'm talking about in Acts chapter four and verse number thirty-one. In Acts chapter four, verse number thirty-one, when they prayed, the whole place where they were was shaking, started shaking. Lord, make me into a vessel of prayer. Mold me into that vessel of shaking prayer. Shaking prayer. Our prayers need to be in faith. Our prayers need to be uh, 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 in expectation. Expectation. And when we come together in a place like this, our prayers need to be in one accord. You know, I don't know if you understand this divine principle called one accord. One accord. That means basically. In layman's language, it's when everybody is on the same page. That's the way I put it. One accord. When you have prayer in one accord, things will shake. Things will shake. God's power will be manifested. You will sense his presence when we pray in one accord, one accord. You see, it only takes a spark to get a fire going, but it only takes also just a few pieces of sin to make the Holy Ghost back up, back up. You see, we can be in one accord, but if there are segments, if there are segments in God's house that are not on the same page, that are not in one accord, that will, that will sometimes filter out the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, understand, the Holy Spirit is offended. He becomes offended when there are individuals in the house that are disturbing the atmosphere. The Holy Spirit is very, very sensitive. And we have to be mindful of that. Your actions, your actions, your behavior can cause the Holy Spirit just to take his hands off. We don't want the Holy Spirit to take his hands off. That's not what we want. So Lord, make me a vessel of shaking prayer, shaking prayer. Lord, make me a vessel of obedience. Make me a vessel of obedience. That, that, that sounds simple, that sounds simple. In Acts chapter four, uh, in verse number 19, listen, we, we need to come away from just hearing. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. All of you here right now are hearing me. You hear me. If you got two ears and you don't have any hearing impediment, you hear me. You hear everything I'm saying. But that doesn't mean that everybody's listening. 
That doesn't mean everybody's listening. Lord, make me a vessel of obedience. Do I, would I rather hear the voices of the world or do I want to listen to the voice of the Lord? We need to make up our minds what we want to do. Elijah said it perfectly. Elijah said it perfectly. He said, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? How long are you going to halt between two opinions? How long are you going to hop back and forth between God and the world? Between Jesus and evil? How long are you going to hop between two opinions? If God is God, serve him! If Baal is God, serve him! But don't hop back and forth. Don't walk the fence. Make up your mind this day who you're going to serve. The Bible says, I laid before you a choice. He says, choose life and live. Choose life and live. Obviously, the opposite of that is choose death and die. You have a choice. You have a choice. Lord, make me a vessel of discernment. Make me a vessel of discernment. What, am I, what are you talking about, Brother Michael? Help me to know the difference between what's of you and what's not of you. Discernment is the only way you're going to know the difference between something that is of God and something that is not of God. If you hear something and it doesn't sound like it's God and you're a Christian, there's a reason. Because it's probably not of God. It's not of God. You must be a vessel of discernment. The devil is a liar. The devil is going to give you, the devil is going to show you things that look, that look genuine. He's going to show you things that look like it's the real thing. But only your exposure to the word of God will allow you to be able to discern what's right from what's wrong. You see how the world works. This is how the world works. We were talking about it in Sunday school. No one seems to think, at least those who, those legislators who have now voted on this particular thing, no one seems to think it's a bad thing to allow an abortion at nine months. No one seems to think it's a bad thing. Come on, everybody. Y'all got to read your newspaper, watch the news just for a little while. Governor Cuomo signed into law. No one, it, abortions are now allowed up to nine months. Up to nine months. So this is signed into law just a few days ago. And, and, and this, is, this, is, this is murder. But no one seems to know, no one seems to be able to discern that this is murder. It, it, it's, it's, it's okay. It's all right. No, it's not okay. Don't even call it abort. That's just flat murder. That's just murder. That's just murder, murder, murder. Nine months old. Nine months old. The baby is coming out. And you change your mind. You decide, I don't want to, I don't want to. Uh, wh however, it is, whatever it is. Now the, no one will be, no one will be, will be punished. It's not a crime. That's not a crime anymore. discernment. The world sees it and says, well, it's just, it's, we are moving forward. That's progressive politics. That's government. We're moving forward. We're moving forward. No, you're not moving forward. You are digressing. You are digressing. This is how Rome, you study your history, this is how Rome fell. Because Rome began uh, to do things that were very bad. And Rome, the mightiest power, one of the mightiest powers on earth at the time, over a period of time, they became nothing and they were conquered. Trust me, those who sign a law like that into place, blood is on their hands. I don't even like to get 
politics like that, but discernment. Lord, make me a vessel of your word. Make me a vessel of your word. Listen. There are a lot of things you can preach. I could get up here, I could get up here on a Sunday morning, every Sunday morning I could get up here and pontificate about social justice. I could talk about how it's wrong that the city does this and how it's wrong. I could get up here and go on and on about social issues. But that's not the gospel. That's not what we are called to do. We are to preach the word in season and out of season. So you come here and you hear, if you listen to me, if you hear me, you're not gonna hear me talk a whole lot. You just heard me talk a little bit, but you won't hear me, you're not gonna hear me talk about politics and, and social issues, but you're gonna hear me talk about Jesus every week. You're gonna hear me talk about how Jesus wants to change your life. You're gonna hear me talk about what Jesus can do. You're gonna hear me talk about justification and sanctification. That you will hear, because that's what the gospel is all about. Preach the word, and you preach, ladies and gentlemen, happens for one hour on Sunday, somebody comes up here and preaches. When you walk out of this door, you're going to be preaching to somebody. When you leave the building, you're going to be preaching to somebody. Somebody in your school is watching you. Somebody in your classroom is watching you. Somebody at your job is watching you. Because if you have made any, if you have made it a point at all to bring up Jesus' name in your talking, as you move through your life, if you have brought up Jesus in any way, shape, or form to let people know that you are a follower of Jesus or that you even go to church, if you put that signal out there, people are going to expect certain things from you. And so if you talk about Jesus a whole lot, if you talk about Jesus a whole lot, but you got a filthy mouth, Something's wrong. Something's wrong. What I would advise, ask the Lord to clean up your mouth or stop talking about Jesus. Because the two don't go together. The two don't go together. You can't, you, you can't go on and on and on about Jesus, but every other word is a curse word. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. And trust me, people hear that and they take that into consideration. So be careful. Lord, make me a vessel of your word. Finally, make me a vessel of faith. A vessel of faith. Lord, help me to believe. Lord, there's a lot I don't believe. There's a lot that I doubt. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Understand that you need to have your faith in the right place. Then we have having strong faith. But what if you have strong faith in the wrong place? Okay? You heard me say it a million times. You don't put your faith in this thing right here. See this, you see, you see, you see, you see this right here? There's a blue claw. Somebody bought me. It says pastor on it. Whatever. If I say everybody come up, I'm going to pray for you right now. And I take this cloth and I put it on you. Trust me. I guarantee you, you are putting your faith in this thing here. Because if I drape this over you, you are believing that because I put this on you, you're going to be better, you're going to be healed, you're going to be touched, you're going to be loose, you're going to be free because I put this thing on you. No. No. Putting something on you does not make your prayer stronger. It does not enhance your prayer. It does not empower you. It does not, it, it, it's, this is not a magic amulet. 
Here you go. Now you're good. No, you're not. No, you're not. Hear me well. You're not. You want to say it's a point of contact. Fine. Don't put your faith in this. Faith is in Jesus. Faith is in Jesus. Faith is in Jesus alone. Lord, make me a vessel of faith. Properly placed faith. Lord, don't let me put my faith in somebody's hand. Don't let me put my faith in the oil. Don't let me put my faith in anything but you. That's not where the faith goes. This can't help you. This can't help you as long as you put your faith in it. It cannot help you. It won't help you. Faith in Jesus Christ alone. And it's Jesus plus nothing else. Jesus plus nothing else. Lord, I want to be a Christian. Lord, I want to be like Jesus. God will honor your prayers as you continue to trust him and trust him alone. Trust him and trust him alone. God will honor you. Do you want to be like Jesus? Do you want to be like Jesus? He's here. He will touch you. He will bring deliverance to your life. But you have to have your faith in the right place. By your heads, by your heads. Lord, there are many here right now, Lord Jesus, who don't know where they stand. They don't know where they stand, Lord Jesus. Lord, sometimes they're in, sometimes they're out, sometimes they're up, sometimes they're down. The devil comes, he lies, he speaks, they listen. Lord, there are many under the sound of your word right now, Lord, who want to follow you. They want to be like you. But Lord, they're finding it very difficult because the world, the flesh, and the devil is giving them a big fight. But Lord, we know that you are able. You are able. Lord, I pray that each and every one under the sound of your word right now, we'll continue to pursue after righteousness and faith and love. Fellowship with the right people. Lord, and allow you to mold them into that person that you would have them to be. Have your way, Jesus. You're here today and you know you're in a fight. You know you're in a fight. You're here today and you, you can feel, you can sometimes feel the enemy breathing down your neck. Spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, you can sense the enemy's presence. You're here today and you know you're in a fight. right where you are. Brother Michael, I'm in a fight. I'm in a battle. I pray. I read. I study. But the enemy is hot on my trail. You see, you may be here today, you may be struggling, but the fact that you're struggling, the fact that you're struggling means
that you're in the process of growing. You are in the process of growing. As you struggle, as you struggle, you will find that the very same way that sometimes you can sense the enemy's presence, that you need to be assured of the fact that God is with you. He is there. He has not abandoned you. He will not abandon you. He is there. Is there anyone else? I'm in a battle. I'm in a struggle. I feel it. I feel it. Is there anyone else? If you lifted up your hand, I want you to stand right where you are. You're in a struggle. Those of you who are here, and I know I was speaking mostly to those who are Christian. If you're, if you're here today, and you don't have a struggle, because if you're a Christian, listen, if you're trying to follow Jesus, if you are really, truly trying to follow Jesus, it means that the devil has a target on you. It means that the devil, Satan, evil forces, let me put it that way, have put out a contract of sorts on you. If you are truly following Jesus, he doesn't want you to follow Jesus. He doesn't want you to put your faith in Jesus. He wants to put, he wants you to put your faith somewhere else. Somewhere else. Come on up, Rob. Come on up. Is there anyone else? I'm battling. I'm fighting. You might say it's a bad thing. But it means that you're doing something right. The fact that the enemy is out on your trail means that you're doing something correct. And the enemy is trying to displace you. He is trying to distract you. He is trying to put you aside. He's trying to do all of these things because you're going in the right direction. God is able. God is able. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. And after all I just finished saying, I'm about to anoint this young brother with oil. Understand, there's no power in the oil. Understand that the oil is symbolic. The oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. I am not putting the Holy Spirit on him. It's just symbolic. And that's all the oil means. The Bible says, the Bible says anoint those who are in need. Anoint them with oil. And they will be healed. So that's what we're doing. But as I anoint him with oil, his faith is in Jesus. His faith is not in this oil. Because this oil is just oil. There's no power in this oil. Amen, Jesus. Lord, I bring my hand to the Lord. Touch him. Lord, touch him right now. Lord, touch him right now. Lord, Lord, you see how the Lord is trying to snatch him away from him. Lord, you see how the enemy is trying to, to wreck his mind.
bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, we bless your name. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing, Lord. We thank you for what you're going to do, Lord Jesus. Lord, have your way, Lord Jesus. Lord, may this word, Lord, penetrate and permeate, Lord, the life and the hearts of those who have gathered here today, Lord Jesus. Lord, some have heard, some have not heard, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you might shake, Lord Jesus, the spirits of those uh, who are in rebellion against you right now, Lord. And yes, there is, yes, there is rebellion in this house. There is rebellion in this house, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray you might shake that rebellion, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you might shake them, Lord Jesus, from the very, their very foundations, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray you might draw them to yourself, Lord Jesus. Bring conviction, Lord Jesus, as only you could bring. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray you might take the heart and heart, Lord Jesus, and give them a heart of flesh. Lord, have your way, Lord. Continue to touch your people. Continue to touch, touch your people with peace. Hallelujah, Lord, have your way. Bless us together as we continue to, to follow after you, to follow hard after you, Lord. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen.